now it's time for the final Q&A in the hall. As always, I would like to ask the first question, but then I will open up for the floor, so you can prepare questions in the meantime. Um, so my first question is that I, I find it very inspiring, the work you each do with paving the way for a different understanding of materials. So you, Rosa, both the uh, research and the artistic sort of showcase what's possible, and in that sense, creating iconic designs that inspires people to maybe copy, imitate, f go beyond. And you at the same time, Laura, and through Kickstarter, are really providing a funding infrastructure that allows people to successfully explore um, productization of these materials. And then I wanted to hear if there's some other ways we can make working with other types of materials more accessible to more people? Is it maybe by maybe redefining what is success? Like, so we see some of these bars are quite high. Like, talk about successful businesses, maybe it's different. Or maybe there are some systems or infrastructures we need to rewire, rethink, uh, policy, etc. And it goes to both of you, this question. Do you want to go first? I mean, I guess there's probably, it's like, renaming what success is or, like, how far you have to go before it's successful is probably an important one, like you say. I think as far as people like attempting to use them or like accessing waste streams and like understanding how they work, there's like quite interesting work that some people do about like uh, making people aware of where the waste is. I think that like really helps of like mapping out exactly what industries are producing what waste and the different people who are up for you taking it. I think that's like, um, really helpful if you're trying to like get into what you could make out of wastes. But also, I think another thing that we found, at least like of kind of scaling up a little bit away from like the artistic towards like, as I said, a room size, it's not like a whole business yet, is like the access to machinery and understanding how to process things is kind of a bit of a step that is like an infrastructural step that could be really helpful to people or like to different systems if people kind of had more open access to machines and processing units and ways of kind of working through waste to get it to like a material that you can make stuff out of. Yeah, and I, I'd say that on an individual level, it's looking in your community and saying, where where is the waste? Where is it going? Could I do something with it? Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be launching a million dollar company or even making thousands of something. It's saying, you know, can I turn this runoff into something new? And this is also happening in the perfume industry um, where not many people know this, but it's many perfumes are made from, um, from oil and from petroleum that even when you have clean uh, perfume, it's not necessarily clean. So some perfumers have started going to uh, local food waste centers and saying, I would like to turn this excess dessert into a vanilla scent. You know, it just, it's looking around and saying, where do I see waste? How can I transform it? Um, and you could do that again. You could go home today and look around your house and say, what am I wasting? How could I give it some sort of new life? Yeah, um, I just, I think, thanks for the answers. And I think if it's just myself, I would still be quite intimidated to go from, let's say, around find a waste and then from there to go to a new material. I, I, it is a bit a daunting, like sort of first step somehow. Mm -hmm. But I, I feel like community and access to tools and space, I guess, is a very good um, start. Okay, do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah, we have one in the very back. So if Eleanor can bring the microphone over there and we also have here in the front. Thank uh, you. You both delivered uh, quite inspirational talks. So I have uh, one question primarily for Rosa, and maybe Laura, you can chip in. I'm just curious as to um, how the tabby concrete is, uh, is that truly circular? Because you had mentioned in your talk that um, by using these waste streams, you have a history of using it and then sometimes encouraging like a new kind of consumerism. Um, do you see this as a way to really solve the waste problem or maybe are we creating other issues down the line? Like for example, encouraging more bivalves in the like Isle of Sky region could have environmental impacts that we don't see until maybe decades later or with scaling up the business, like how big can you really grow it? Those kind of things. Yeah, thank you. Um, Many questions. I feel like it's, it's very hard sometimes to say like, 
uh, that you won't create like rippling effects that you don't know further down the line when you're like trying to develop something. Um, I guess it's just like really important to be aware of what might happen. I think with the tabby concrete or even the tiles that we make that's like very similar in process, I wouldn't say that we're a circular economy. I don't think you could because eventually maybe they'd end up in a building rubble somewhere and someone might make something else out of them, but they might not. And it's very hard to say that um, that you won't ever produce waste in your processes. It's just like maybe like important to think about an alternative way of seeing it as waste or like encouraging things to be used further down the line. And I guess in the Isle of Skye, with bi like bivalves or their consequences, we actually really encourage the growth of like um, the bivalve farms, like oyster farms and mussel farms. And we're trying to, within our kind of intertidal growing areas, trying to do that ourselves. And that's mainly because we do really believe that they're quite a positive food source that um, when you grow it, you don't have to put any input in. So you don't feed it or fertilize it or have to kind of take any other source and feed it in that then might um, also pollute that area. It's um, they purely eat from the ocean. And so um, I wouldn't worry too much about people farming them too much. I'd actually really love that. And it might also challenge salmon farming in different ways. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that fully answered your question, but I guess like you can never know. I don't really believe that circular economies are like um, a thing that's that possible. I think it's just important to kind of foresee consequences and trying to like act as well as you can. Yeah. Do you follow like along the way, like I guess you monitor along the way or you engage with Isle of Sky or the local communities or like how do you see if it's shifting something there, because I, I guess the question is the externalities that will come or could come mm -hmm. from, a, let's say, a focus towards now we need seashells because we can do products from it, right? And then I was like wondering, do you, yeah, how do you s monitor? Is it like by staying there or talking with people or like how do you see if there are potential negative consequences from it? Uh, well, we work like very closely. So I should have said in my presentation, um, I'm the only person who's like not based on the Isle of Skye that like, works every week on this project. We have um, Shona Cameron, who's like the project manager, and Joel Franklin, who manages the workshop, and a number of people that like are involved in the shell processing, and also the kind of workshops we do. And we like work closely with the different communities that we work with to um, like teach about these ingredients and teach about these materials and kind of teach people how to make them. Um, but I guess as far as like monitoring the effects of what we do, I, I guess the like main monitoring that we're doing right now is seeing how many people are kind of taking on this change in diets and like um, investigating their own relationship with the coast and like what food they could access and what kind of materials they could produce. I think our ultimate aim, as I said, is to commercialize these tiles in order to build towards a production facility. And that's something that's going to have so many questions about um, how to be as best as we can be um, that we're still grappling with, I guess. But I think it's just like a constant conversation with the people that run the workshop more every day. Thank you. We had another question down here in the front. Sorry to Eleanor for kind of making the journey the longest possible. <laughs> thank, thank you both for your talks. Um, my question is for Rosa. I, um, I'd like to pick up on something that you said quite, quite briefly in the beginning of your talk, which is that you like to take a metabolic view of the environment or the built environment. And I find this really appealing. And I found myself thinking, I could imagine what it would be to take a, a dynamic or a kinesthetic or a sonic view of the built environment. But I'm wondering if you could give us some pointers on how to take a metabolic view of it. Like, what should we pay attention to? Yeah, thanks. Nice question. Um, I guess, like, the reason we say that is partly because we're starting with food. So we're starting to think of, like, what you're allowed to enter your body and then what pro is processed through your body. And in consequence, like, also that food processes you and, like, has an effect on you. And I think it's a very kind of chemical view of the built environment or, like, the view of our spaces as something that process us and kind of move through us and all of these materials and chemicals and... Um, living things or inert things like are moving through us and processing us as much as we're like processing the pollutants and the food and the air and um, the pollen and everything that's around us. It's kind of this constant exchange of like um, 
ingesting and metabolizing and I guess those kind of things is how we think about it, which is why um, thinking about waste is kind of interesting for us. Cool, thank you. All right, was it? Yeah, and we have one more here. Thank you both for great speeches. Uh, Laura, uh, you work with a big company, uh, as do a lot of us here today. Um, and you gave some great examples on, on what people are doing on Kickstarter. Uh, what does Kickstarter do in this area? I'd very interesting. Sure. Yeah, and I actually, you know, I was kicking myself for not mentioning this earlier, but Kickstarter is actually a public benefit corporation, uh, which separates us from, from many others, and that it's actually built in our charter that we have to uh, essentially help the world in some way. So each year we give about 5% of our profits to different um, organizations or charities we believe in. So um, we get to decide as a company where they go into, whether it's a sustainability company, we've given to a company called Slow Factory in the US, which also works with um, recycling materials. But um, we take it very seriously that we're, we're not just here to, to kind of take resources. We also want to give back. We also have a rigorous volunteer program. Um, and sustainability is really at the heart of what we do. Uh, for years, we had a headquarters that we tried to make as green as possible. We're now fully remote so that we could be, I guess, in some ways, the ultimate sustainability is just staying at home. But, um, but yes, we, we take it very seriously that, you know, in some ways, you know, maybe we'd be an even bigger company if we were in a PBC, but it's so critical to what we do. Not many people know this, but we're actually, it's, it's less than 100 people total work at Kickstarter. We're still very small and we're small on purpose so that we can really um, make sure that the work that we do uh, stays core to our mission. And I guess also in, I mean, just one of the reasons you are here is also the, the work you do with the people who are doing these projects, right? So I yes. mean, you had this slide with all these like initiatives that you are kind of working with the people of small batches, etc. which I, I mean, I think that is also work, right? And I actually wanted to ask a little bit how for you working with the people having a hands-on and how for you also to touching those materials, how it makes you think about materials because you both are indirectly or directly are really in touch with this kind of thing and how it is to feel the hands and touch and talk directly with people doing these things. Y yeah, I'd, I'd say for me it was a big part of why I started working at Kickstarter is when I was a journalist for so many years, I was seeing the end product of, of once things were already to life and you got the press release and they'd already told their story that what it would be like to actually be in the studios and doing this hands-on work with these creators to, to turn something that, you know, was very theoretical into an actual real world project. So part of my work is going to universities, to going to artist studios and actually trying to find these creators. So that's how I kind of, I, I differ from a salesperson in that I see myself as amplifying the message of these creators is that we want to see them succeed as much as they want to succeed. And, and built into our, our, um, our model actually is that we do not take any sort of payment unless a creator is successful. So once a project launches, we'll take a certain percentage, but otherwise we won't. So both on a, a moral level, but also on a very bare bones practical level, we are invested in the success of these materials. Uh, and just on a personal level, it's incredible to see what people are doing and, and are able to accomplish when they're given that little boost. Um, I guess I guess for me, like working closely with the materials. So normally if I go up to Sky, like I have a week or two, like fully in the workshop. And I guess a lot of it is also like the amount of work that goes into making the materials. Like we have apprentices in the workshop and the director, Joel, in the workshop. And like just kind of doing the actual labor of making them is also kind of sometimes a bit like part of getting to grips of how you make it is actually the kind of job and labor day and work days involved. I feel like it's always quite present when I'm working quite closely with them. And yeah, I guess the way that the materials processed and like collected and all of the kind of logistics behind being able to make these things happen, I think come to the forefront when actually there in working with them. I guess also I was just also thinking in the sense to show how you can put in locality in the materials when you start to work with them like seashells from a specific point right and you can imitate things and i was also wondering that since 
by being somewhere physically and putting your hands in, if you then also, like it changes also the looks of things maybe, or like the aesthetics that you are in the end of the day pursuing. Yeah, I think like in the murals that we showed that are getting installed into five community spaces in the sky, they're all, they're quite like um kind of visual or like they're depicting different scenes, but they're kind of trying to depict different scenes like from the island. And I think when we're kind of like working with the material, what I kind of get a lot out of is that we also know the kind of people that produce the materials or like we know the people that produce this seaweeds in the restaurants and also the like scallops that get collected and in very specific ways that are respectful to the environment and we kind of know those producers and we know the chefs and I think like knowing everything that has gone into it and then kind of processing that material is like a really kind of um, uh, rewarding way of kind of looking at it I guess. Thank you. We have time for a final question from the audience over here. Hi, so my name is Magnus and I have a question about the seashell because everyone has put put up a seashell in their hand and loved the <laughs> texture and stuff like that. And it's the pearly surface that is you fell in love with. But can you, in your product, can you use that pearly uh, surface? Can you cr recreate that pearly surface or did it just become more like, a, like concrete or like a, a powder or stuff like that? Well, it de okay, so you can really get the pearly surface if you have a big enough um, crush on the shell. So if the aggregate's really big and you see like the whole shell, um, which is quite hard to do because uh, it's not like cement or resin that really binds stuff together. So um, when we manage to get a really big crush and get the textures of the shell, you can really see the pearls. Um, but when you grind them, I mean, it depends on the species because uh, mussels, you get a lot more of that texture and pearlescent from than something like oysters. And so it um, depends on how much of the species we've got in our big mass of collection at that time. Um, it's something that we're actually really trying to work out with the press tiles, um, because once they're like put under loads of pressure, they have they kind of do look a bit more pearly. Um, but the, we, yeah, it's the it's the most beautiful thing and most like enchanting thing that people get drawn to. But um, it kind of depends on the different batches. Sometimes we get it more than others. Yeah. Thank you. Can you just give, please, a warm applause to Rose and Laura? <laughs> now we conclude the sessions of the conference. Uh, there is one final keynote which will continue designing with compassion. And before we just let you go, I just want to remind you that a conference like the conference we also relies on a lot of infrastructures. And up here in the front is Beth, who has been helping me being the stage manager like the last two days and had helped me could relax a lot on the stage. We have the kind volunteers, there's the film crew, the Carl who's sitting down at the audio and might not be listening because he's focusing on other things. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's the whole Media Evolution team with Hildred, who has been the creator. And if you see any of these people, I think it's always very nice to say thank you or give them any sort of encouragement. It's always appreciated. Thank you. Enjoy the break. Thank you.